note in this next part the time factor this is pure speculation or hypothesis by myself and Bill as there is no evidence to say the offender came to Glenelg in a car and none to say he did not he might have come in by tram for all we know if this was an unknown person however we later argue in this episode, if Hayden Phipps is to be believed and therefore an eyewitness in this abduction, then this individual was not an unknown person. It was Harry Phipps. I, Bill, and many other professionals believe this to be the case. And keep in mind for this next section, the children leave the change rooms at about 12.15 p.m. and walk away from Wenzel's Bakery and their bus stop, only to end up there back at Wenzel's Bakery around 15 minutes later, which indicates wherever they went to collect the magical pound note, it doesn't seem to appear far. The more I look at Harry, of all the people who've been suggested over the years, and there have been many, I think he is the most likely to be the actual offender. Also, in any direction one wishes to walk, they do so at an easygoing, carefree, relaxed, playful Grant Beaumont pace. And we should also consider the stifling 100 degree heat that would adversely affect the children the further they walked and Grant's younger years. Now, Jenny, Jane's best friend, stated Grant complained when the girls walked too far when gossiping at the beach and sometimes Jane needed to carry him on her hip, further slowing them down. Jenny Muirhead, Jane's best friend, often joined Jane and her siblings on their adventures but not this day. She was really quite amazing, you know. She could catch a bus anywhere around Somerton, Brighton, Glenelg. She would have herded them off the bus. She would have carried Grant and put him on her hip, which she always did. And the man certainly did not wish to direct attention to himself, Jane, Anna or Grant. You remember Australia Day, 1966? Yeah. A reason why. All right, but many but It was a real were... hot bastard of a day. As hot as hell, it must be 40 something plus. Also, the children arriving at Wenzel's Bakery are about approximates as Beth, the Wenzel's Bakery shop assistant, she's now deceased, was not definitive about the time the children were in the shop. She just gave approximates. But that is all me and Bill have got to go on. And this is one of the mysteries of that day. Earlier at the beach, the children had lost their money. Yet Jane now pays for their lunch with a crisp one pound note. A note her mother had not given her when she'd left home. The mother gave him eight shillings and sixpence to get the, the lunch. Jane handed them a pound note. What did they buy with the pound note? The children bought cakes and a pie for the man. That's what they said, a pie for the man. The kids were, the kids said that. They, yes. were, they were heard saying this. Yes. They said it's the attendant at this shop. Mm. That's when they disappear into thin air. Yeah. Now the most plausible directions are, number one, from the change rooms at about 12.15 p.m., the children walk with this man in a northerly direction away from Wenzel's Bakery in their bus stop to his vehicle at the car park, as you can see here, and drive to his residence in another suburb to collect the pound note and return to Wenzel's Bakery. Two, they walk in a northerly diagonally across Collie Reserve to the Anzac Highway to his house some way up in this direction and walk back to Wenzel's Bakery. Or number three, as Bill Hayes and myself and backed up by other professionals, the most likely direction is up Augusta Street, as you can see here, to Phipps's residence. Why? We believe Hayden Phipps, Harry's eldest son, is an eyewitness, and the time factor does fit. Now, number one, the use of a car. Detectives in 1966 and since have ruled out the use of a car over any significant distance for many plausible reasons. Now, there's more chance to be seen Control over the children may be challenging once the kids realise things are not right. And if this man arrived by car, this could represent he is not likely from Glenelg or the Glenelg area, which is Occam's Razor. The simplest solution is usually the best. 
So at 12.15 p.m., Jane, Anna, Grant and the man walk from the change rooms north 120 metres to the car park you can see here. This aerial image was taken in the late 50s, mid to late 50s, we're not quite sure. Bill and I have walked at a relaxed pace to where the car park once was, considering the several variables mentioned, including other distractions, which were thousands of noisy, excitable children at the reserve that day and beach. Also, at the car park, the children and the man would not likely have immediately hopped in the car. Why? Many of us can relate to this back in the 60s. What is a car made of back in the 60s? Metal, the metal dashboard, the metal side things of the car trims, and then you have lots and lots of vinyl. Now the children, Jane, Anna and Grant, like many others in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, needed to place their towels on the bench, vinyl bench seats, the seat and the back to take the sting out of the scorching vinyl well before they hopped in the car, further slowing down their departure. Now, Bill and I leave the car park area at about 12.25 and we haven't even left Collie Reserve as yet. We drive along the busy Anzac Highway, as you can see here, and none of this is in a rush. Why? Well, it's not to unsettle the children and not bring attention to them. Now, the Anzac Highway connects Glenelg. It's the main thoroughfare, the main highway into Adelaide. It's 12 kilometers long, and it's a busy highway now, and it was a busy highway back then. Now, myself and Bill drive a relatively short two kilometers to the next suburb. The Anzac Highway route is the simplest way. Again, that's Occam's Razor. Now, we just go along two kilometers and turn left. That was the easiest way. Now, what are the variables? You've got traffic, you've got some traffic lights, you stop and collect the pound note, then in the car, back to Wenzel's Bakery. What are the variables coming back? You've got traffic lights, the midday traffic along the Anzac Highway, and have a look at this down Brighton Road, another major thoroughfare, and the busy jetty road, and heaven forbid, if you get caught behind a tram, or you can go the back streets, and you're trying to manage three hungry children, finding a car spot close to Wenzel's Bakery, the children walking to Wenzel's Bakery. So we did this, myself and Bill, and we arrived at 12.50, taking in the number of variables in play. Now this time is blowing out. Even if the man lives within two kilometers and further he lives away, the timing factor flies right out the window but of course it's a speculation, but worth some thought. And the question is, why drive back to Wenzel's Bakery? Well, the children needed to get their bus home, but they didn't get their bus home. So what's the attraction with Wenzel's Bakery? Because there's also many other bakeries in South Australia. South Australia is known for its myriad of delicious bakeries. So again, what's the attraction with this bakery? Well, it could be the children's favourite. But three hungry children, I don't know, when I was a kid in the 1960s, any cake shop will do. They sell the cake, they sell pies, pasties, cream cakes. If you're hungry, please, any bakery will do. And what about here? Why not the Orange Spot Cafe? It's the easiest most accessible, it's right along the Anzac Highway, you can see it here. Why not just come back to the um, Orange Spot Cafe? It's still there today, Wenzel's is not, the Orange Spot Cafe is still there. Now a car may indicate the man is from outside Glenelg. The use of one is plausible but not likely due to the time factor involved. Number two. They all walked to where the man lived along the Anzac Highway, as you can see here. A few things. From the change rooms at about 12.15, Bill and I walk northeast across Collie Reserve to the highway, walk along this very busy road. Altogether, we walk about 320 metres, so not that far. We stop at a residence, we wait for five minutes, and walk back to Wenzel's Bakery. Now, the simplest routes, Occam's Razor, 
the children and the man or the children walk back down along the Anzac Highway down Sussex Street. The children were not seen walking back along Collie Reserve close to Collie Terrace. So we'll use Sussex Street as you can see here. So we took the Sussex Street route. We arrive at Wenzel's Bakery at about 12.43. Now the second time myself and Bill did it, this was 12.48. Now this is plausible but not likely as there is an exponential chance of the children and the man being seen the longer they walk along the Anzac Highway. Also walking any distance in 100 degree stifling heat is trying for any age and due to Grant's tender years he may have been complaining to Jane who may have to carry him on her hip further slowing down their pace. All of them would have felt quite uncomfortable under the midday sun and all are now very hungry. And if up this way, why not buy lunch again at the Orange Spot Cafe, as we can see here. What is the attraction with Wenzel's Bakery? Now other streets they may have taken after walking along the Anzac Highway, Nile, Waterloo, Henry, Byron, or over the other side as you can see here, Adelphi or Sturt Street. The further they go, if they take this road, the time is starting to blow out. Now if they take these roads, they walk down to and along Jetty Road, as you can see here, again Occam's Razor. There is much more chance to be seen and the timing is blowing out. Now this is plausible but not likely. Now what about walking northeast across to Collie Terrace past the Rondarville, as you can see here, just left past the bowling alley that you can see here, it's not there any longer. Now, no one we know who lived in that particular area in 1966, 76, 86, etc., had been presented to the police, or we don't believe had been, as a predatorial pedophile that did fit the description, hands out pound notes, and as a pension for children to name a few of many pieces of circumstantial evidence as we could see in the previous episode. However, there is one such individual who did and resided close to Collie Reserve in 1966, and that individual is Harry Phipps, as detailed, as I said, in circumstantial evidence, which leads to number three, and myself and Bill call this lucky guess Hayden. If you believe his account, Hayden Phipps is an eyewitness in this heinous crime, and this individual is no longer an unknown person. He is Harry Phipps. Now, Hayden could be untruthful. However, Steve Van Apren, polygraph expert, arguably Australia's number one polygraph expert, does say that it's highly likely Hayden is telling the truth about his sexual abuse and about seeing the children in the backyard that day but he's definitely hiding more. So how much credence should we place on Hayden Phipps's story? Internationally accredited polygraph specialist and former policeman Steve Van Apron has no doubt he was truthful after analysing a recording of an interview conducted by retired major crime detective Bill Hayes, an independent investigator for the Saturn Man's authors. And this is also backed up by when we sent, myself and Bill, we sent the recorded interview over to a polygraph expert in Europe. They came back with roughly the same, that it's highly likely Hayden is telling the truth about his sexual abuse and seeing the Beaumont children in his backyard, but they do have some question marks and they also said he is, it looks like he is hiding more. Now at 12.15, the children and the man walk from the change rooms along the cement pathway, as you can see here, past the Rondarville, across the lawns, and directly up Augusta Street, as we can see here. Now, Bill and I have walked across the reserve directly to Phipps's residence, 190 metres up that road, at a more leisurely pace, knowing the children most probably knew they were not walking too far. As Jane's best friend said, they knew the lay of the land in the Glenelg back streets. Now, when interviewed by Bill Hayes, when does Hayden say he saw the children enter the backyard? Around lunchtime. Lucky guess, Hayden. 
he said he was home for lunch from working at the bowling alley with his friend. I have spoken to this friend and he certainly said we were working at the bowling alley in the 60s, but he didn't know if it was that day or not. Now Hayden had no idea when the children left Collie Reserve. He could have said he saw them in the morning or afternoon, but instead he says it was around lunchtime. Well, did you see them talking to Harry? Yeah. Well, I saw him coming into the backyard from the, the Cubby house. They came to Dad's car. I think they went inside the house and that's it. Did you hear what they're saying? No, it's too far away. That is a lucky guess, Hayden. On the morning of Australia Day 1966, Harry's then 15-year-old son, Hayden, went to a part-time job at a nearby bowling alley. What time did you get home? It was around 12 or 12.30. You said you saw the kids? Yeah, I've seen them come in. Can you describe them to me now? The little kids, one's a little bit shorter than the rest, like short haircuts. I think they had towels. I think they had beach towels. Now, according to Hayden, the children walked into the back gate, or through the back gate, where he states the eldest child had a shoulder type bag and brightly coloured towels, like orange and reds and yellows, and all had the same haircuts. <laughs> Lucky guess, Hayden. They did have brightly coloured towels, as you can see here from a newspaper article back in 1966. Now Hayden says Harry started loading the boot with surfboard type bags, apparently after the children had exited the house through the front door that leads down Sussex Street. And as one can see here, it's about 200 metres. And then we believe if they're heading that way, they're going to Wenzel's Bakery to buy food. Now, if we believe Hayden, Harry was loading up the boot with satin garments, which were inside these surfboard type bags, which could mean, it could mean that others are involved because you've got a lot of satin and it's no mean feat to abduct three children in broad daylight. You really need a lot of control. Now, it could mean that Harry had some help, but of course that's conjecture. Now, after walking the 190 metres up to Augusta Street from the change rooms, as you can see here, we wait several minutes outside Phipps's residence and walk down Sussex Street to Jetty Road and to Wenzel's Bakery, 200 metres. We arrived at Wenzel's Bakery in about 10 minutes. Now, considering other variables, the second walk myself and Bill take took around 13 minutes. So the timing does fit. Now, what was not seen at Wenzel's Bakery? Jane's carry bag and the children's towel. The shop assistant did not report this. So where are these items? If this is Harry Phipps, he could be a betting man waiting for them to return. If not, he only loses a pound note. If they come back, it's a win-win for him. And remember, they need their belongings, which are back at his place, so he's on a sure bet. The more I look at Harry, of all the people who've been suggested over the years, and there have been many, I think he is the most likely to be the actual offender. Or Chris Illingsworth, a criminal investigative analyst states. Now this below is a lengthy but worthy read. Now note again, Chris does not say this individual is Harry Phipps. However, she goes on to explain. When the children entered Wenzel's cake shop on Mosley Street, they were unaccompanied by the man and were not carrying their towels, bags, etc. This was most likely because the offender had now obtained a vehicle and their property was left inside the vehicle while he parked nearby to appear unconnected to the children. The purchase of the food and drinks would have been to subdue any concerns the children had about unexpectedly finding themselves in the company of this man, plus to reinforce their sense of trust in him. Now more so, it would have been to generate a sense of quid pro quo. I did something for you, now you do something for me, to further manipulate them. Now Chris goes on to say, 
While it is possible there was no vehicle at this point, it is more likely there was a vehicle involved. The man had to constantly manipulate and control the children to comply with his directions and not panic a crying or screaming child which would have attracted attention. Now suppose the children had to carry that amount of food, two large drink bottles or their clothing and towels etc on a hot day along crowded streets which was Australia Day for an unknown distance following this man. In that case they had become tired, distressed and begun to query why they were walking with the food and drink. Such a situation would have been a lot for the man to manage all the time trying to avoid the gaze of onlookers. Now on the other hand a vehicle at this point of time offered the man concealment as he waited for a short distance away holding on to their belongings knowing they would be compelled to return to him in the car. The children would also have expected to travel home in a vehicle given it was just 2.5 kilometres away. And as we know at the bakery Jane bought one pie, five pasty, six finger buns and two large bottles of fizzy drink. Now this is just myself and Bill talking, but that's a lunch for six. Jane, Anna, Grant, Nancy and the man. Who's the sixth person? The only other person that we mention here is Hayden Phipps. Of course, this is conjecture. Now what happened next would have been decidedly frightening for the children. According to some senior employees or former senior employees of Castello Factory and a few close acquaintances, one dare not to go against Harry Wishes or he could turn very nasty very quickly. And at some point he did and myself and Bill believe the children cowered under many harsh words spoken at them. Now before I go any further, this is where geographic profiling comes into play. Myself and Bill have written a chapter on geographic profiling. What does it mean? Well, geographic profiling is a criminal investigative tool that analyzes the locations of a connected series of crimes to determine the offender's most likely place of residence, place of work, social venues and travel routes known as their spatial patterns and as Colin Johnson pro professional geographic profiler states this technique works because criminal behavior is not random that these individuals follow the same lines motivation opportunity mobility and perception and based on four main principles routine activity God, that's Harry Phipps, Mr. Routine. Rational choice principle. Rational choice would be a crowded place where a lot of kids are playing. Least effort principle. I mean, that's pretty self-explanatory. Least effort would be walking down to Collie Reserve where a pedophile would find his candy shop. And distance decay. Again, distance decay is what it means. What it says is that the less distance you have to travel, the better. Now geographic profiling looks at the location of a crime scene and the offender's residence in mobility crime triangles, that word triangle. Their findings reveal that most of the homicides fall within the categories of the offender's mobility and total mobility. Their results show the validity of the distance decay function with over 70% of homicides like this occurring within a 10 kilometer radius of the offender's residence. Now it appears that under certain circumstances sexual murderers perceive their surroundings as a safe place to commit their homicide safe place, their comfort zone. What is also noteworthy are the words crime triangle. This is what we believe we have in the Beaumont case. From where the children were playing at Collie Reserve to Harry Phipps's house to Wenzel's Bakery. And as Alan Whitaker noted many years ago, this is the crime's Bermuda Triangle. 
Now let's recap. The morning started with Anna and Grant saying that Jane's got a boyfriend, Jane's got a boyfriend, which they were uh, sort of pinpointing that she's got a boyfriend at the beach. When they get to the beach, remember the man was already lying there before they even got there. He was lying down and he was never seen swimming. His hair was brushed back and parted to one side. And it's that part to the one side that leads to one to think that he wasn't there to swim. He was there for something else. And therefore it doesn't take a rocket science to work that one out wide. Why? He was traveling light. He had no carry bag. And during it, if he did bring a wallet, he didn't have a wallet anymore. Did he have car keys? Could have, he could have had a car, but none was seen. The staring, he was staring at the children or watching them, but he was constantly watching them as they were playing in the shallows, as they walked up, as they walked across underneath the sprinklers. And as I mentioned previously, and this will be in other episodes, Linda was talking about the staring, the girl that was uh, allegedly sexually abused by Harry Phipps. The boys at the back of the factory, I mean, they were 15 and 16 years old. They noted it was quite eerie. And of course, the Adelaide Oval, the man standing behind Joanne Ratcliffe and Kirsty Gordon was staring or watching at them. It's conjecture, of course, but worth some thought. It had to be done on the long weekend and finished by Sunday night. It was hot as heck, really hot. Uh, occasionally come over to the hole and say, no, I want it deeper. And then you just sit there and stare at us. Also, the children looked like they knew him. In fact, it's highly likely they knew him because they walked over to him, not the other way around. And, and I might digress here a bit, but can you remember when you were a kid that you saw an adult lying down and you go up and not knowing who they were and started jumping over them and started flicking him with towels? I never did that when I was a kid and neither did my friends. If it was a, an uncle uh, down the beach or if it was a parent of one of the, uh, my friends I was playing with, or, or new at school, you'd go over and have a quick chat, but that was all. But this really seemed like that they had already met and the rendezvous was pre-arranged. Also at Collie Reserve, they had no money. Yes, Jane came to Collie Reserve with money, but it got pinched. His money got pinched. He ha said so. If it was a thief, the thief had gone over and pinched or taken out Jane's purse and also gone into his clothes and it was a snatch and grab. So nobody has any money and yet Jane arrives at Wenzel's Bakery around 20 to 30 minutes later with a new crisp pound note. On the day the Beaumont children disappeared, they were last seen buying lunch with a one pound note at Wenzel's Bakery. If you talk to anybody in the 60s that was a kid or an adult, that how much a pound note was, that was a wow factor. And Jane was given that pound note. You have her confidence. Someone must have given it to them. And we know that Harry, could we have statements from a number of people, including the son, that Harry, if he wanted you to do something or disappear, he would give you a pound note. Isn't that interesting? Prior opportunity, when did he have a chance to go over and look inside Jane's bag, of course, when they were playing underneath the sprinklers. Again, conjecture, but it's worth considering. The next, why? Why does he feel the need to dress these children? It was so simplistic that Anna, or, or not just Anna, but Grant, four years old, he was quite capable to pull up his shorts, put on his sandals. There was no need to be. But there's a few things here. The colors of the towels and the colors of what the children were wearing, again, is darkly reminiscent of some of Harry Phipps's favorite satin colors. And I know I say it again, conjecture, of course. And the time factor involved. The, the main time factor that fit is if it's Harry Phipps and myself and Bill Hayes believe it is, and so do many other experts, then the time factor fits. They walk up to Harry Phipps's house, they get the money according, and we do have an eyewitness, 
If you believe Hayden, he's an eyewitness, he sees them walk in, they obviously must have collected the pound note because we knew that Harry Phipps was known to give out pound notes and they walked straight down to Wenzel's Bakery. Now the time factor, as me and Bill found out, we were actually quite surprised. We thought, my God, it fits at Wenzel's Bakery. What wasn't seen? The lady, Beth, who served Jane, she knew Jane, she was a regular and she was a regular. She knew Jenny, Jenny Jane's best friend. They used to go to Wenzel's quite often. What wasn't seen? No drying towels, no carry bag. Where in the hell were they? Well, of course, if Jane's left them back at Harry Phipps's place, let's say it's Harry Phipps's place because that's what we're honing in on. They've left it there. What is he doing? That guy is betting a pound note that these kids come back with lunch. Now, if they don't, and Jane's a very trusting person, what has he done? He's lost a pound note. But if her bag and towels are back there, she has to go back anyway, and he's a nice man. And remember, what did they buy at Wenzel's Bakery? I know I'm going off on a bit of a tangent here, but one pie, five pasties, six finger buns, and two large bottles of fizzy drink. That is a lot of lunch for four people, if it was for four. Anna, Grant, Jane, and Mum. There's a lunch there for six. The man, let's say it's Harry Phipps, but who is the other one? And I know what you're thinking. Could it have been Hayden Phipps? And I know I'm going off on a tangent, and I know it's conjecture, but it's worth a considering again. And I'll say it again, the old adage, follow the money. Jane gets a pound note, unheard of. It raised the police's or detective's eyebrows back in 1966 and it has ever since. And yet three to four days later, Robin and David are pay, paid in pound notes. And we know through talking to psychologists that the pound note was Harry Phipps's calling card. It's also interesting to note that 95% of what we do is subconscious. Harry Phipps was leaving a trail. He was leaving a trail of pound notes. He didn't even know it because, as I said, that pound note was his calling card. It said, I am Harry Phipps. I am here. I'm important. Look at these children. Wow factor, they love me. Look at those boys or teenagers digging that hole. How excited they were. I am up there, they're down here. I have control. Now I'll conclude with quoting Peter Alexander, former head of the Police Association of South Australia. This type of offender, this type of killer, you just cannot get a handle on. Even on a worldwide basis, these are extraordinary crimes. The Beaumont children in 1966 and the Adelaide Oval abduction in 1973. The psychology and supreme confidence of this guy is astounding. One group of children taken from a crowded beach and the other one from a crowded sporting field in broad daylight. Overall, the clues left that fateful day would likely indicate that the individual involved did not live far from Collie Reserve due to the time factor involved. Now myself and Bill Hayes asked the question, could this abduction be that simple that the perpetrator was always hidden right under our collective noses in clear sight of Collie Reserve for decades? In the next episode, myself and Bill Hayes expose over 10 pieces of mostly corroborated circumstantial evidence that when combined with clues missed and the time factor episodes, leads one to the inevitable conclusion that Harry Phipps is the killer of the missing Beaumont children. Myself and Bill Hayes leave you with the very sage words of Dr. Terence G. Lichtenwald. PhD, licensed clinical criminal psychologist, forensic examiner, Illinois, USA, who has worked extensively with the FBI. I quote, Harry Phipps to me is a serial sexual deviant 
pedophile and the primary suspect in the disappearance of the missing Beaumont children. This book should be an essential read for any police force library. Well, I think that's enough from me for now. If you wish to find out the truth like myself and Bill, click the links below, like and subscribe. So until next episode, Circumstantial Evidence, I'm Stuart Mullins and I really enjoyed your company.